pleasure to be here with Mr. Barry O'Brien. Welcome, sir, to the Kolkata Literature Festival. Your session just finished, and you spoke about identity there. So, what were your sort of major takeaways? Two or three major takeaways from the session. Well, I think the session was incredible, considering that uh, on my left was a lady who is uh, taking forward an amazing, uh, I mean, cause, as it were, of uh, write fictional writing by women in Afghanistan and now in Assam. Incredible. On my right was uh, uh, Nilanjana, who's uh, as a journalist written an excellent book on. On you know how uh, the, from the viewpoint of a middle class woman and 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 her family etc. So that was there. I think it was a wonderful platform for me to project my community as a community that is settled down very well in modern India because there are many who uh, still feel or I don't know how why they feel that way that many Anglo Indians are aloof from mainstream etc. Which is all. Humbug now. Uh, it may have been true 50, 60 years ago, but uh, it's absolutely untrue now. Uh, our contribution to the nation is well docu- not well documented, now well documented in my book. So, with its armed forces, the, the Anglo Indian system of education, the English language, the language that you and I are speaking in, this is all a con- contribution of my community and uh, women, the Anglo Indian woman going out and being the first to go out and work 100, 120 years ago. So, uh, f- I think now everybody is quite comfortable with the fact that, like other communities, the Anglo Indian community has also made a significant contribution. We are very, very comfortable. Yes, we haven't disappeared yet. We're small in number. Many went away in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. They're not going away now. If they are, they're going for the same reason reasons as anybody else. But uh, so that's it. Yes, mixed marriage means the child of a an Anglo Indian girl who marries out, her children are not Anglo Indian. So the number will be coming down that way. But ours is not to reason why and worry about these things. Ours is just to to live uh, live our cultures and our lifestyle in this beautiful mosaic which is India, which I came I was really pumped up and I was really feeling all charged up. Of course I would have required a few more hours, but I think it really went down well. I think it's a wonderful platform. Uh, at you know, at the biggest book fair in the world, surely, uh, to have this, and uh, I would uh, appeal to the to the organizers to seriously think of doing one or two things with children, with school students. I think that would be good. Wonderful. Now you spoke about the different aspects in which Anglo Indians have contributed to Indian society, and some of them are perhaps better known than others. For example, education. But what would be the perhaps the more obscure aspects or the most underrated aspects that don't get talked about much that you talk about in your book and would also briefly like to mention here? Well, I just I said just said uh, women uh, because 120 years ago uh, women wore dresses, were nurses. Or you know were there? It, it just imagine in a room full of uh, soldiers who are wounded, not wearing anything. Nobody could go there. No one, no one would step in. The Anglo Indian nurse stepped in, so just as an example, you know. So I think I've highlighted the contribution of women. I've highlighted the contribution of uh, the fact that people went to our schools who are extreme left. In their political views, extreme right in their political views, uh, down the center, uh, people of all walks of life. So the contribution has to be measured with that. You know, the other thing that I've highlighted is: can you believe it? Till 1942, Anglo Indians were singing "God Save the King," and just five years later, Leslie Claudius, six years later, 1948, he's standing and getting all choked when the tiranga goes up. When India won the Olympic Games in 1948, so see the transformation. You know, I mean, and and and, and a, what should I say? A community choosing, you know, and as I said, uh, it sort of uh, it suffered the cold betrayal of an old nation, that's the British, and the warm embrace of a new nation. So that trans, you know, transformation, uh, and it was so. What should I say? It wasn't jerky at all. You know, I don't think twenty, thirty years is, is is anything in history. You know, so now you will see Anglo Indians really comfortable in their skin, speaking other Indian languages, competing. We are less sporty. We are less less fun loving. We are less outgoing because we become more competitive and more education centric, etc. But uh, we're very much around and. Um, uh, I, I, I do think that if we had our own little Goa or our own little Sikkim, you know, 
within the state of India, that would have been incredible because it would have been, become an educational hub, particularly a school education hub, an entertainment hub, uh, you know, people coming around. And then I, it would have been easier to, to keep going on as Anglo-Indians, though we were, we're happy as we are. What do you think is responsible for that smooth transition that you just mentioned? I mean, there are a lot of communities, minorities especially, who haven't been able to transition very smoothly in terms of Indian fabric, Indian culture. But what stands out about the Anglo-Indians and the way temperamentally, culturally, they've been able to integrate into India and make it their own? I don't fully agree with you. I think most people have done it. Ours was the tough one, actually. Because ours is not, uh, we're not a religious minority. Okay, we're all most, almost all of us are Christians, but we're not a religious minority. We're a linguistic minority and we are a cultural minority, social, socially. And we were only born because the country was colonized. You know, so that put us in a real middle of the road situation, neither here nor there. I've talked about being between two stools in my book. I hope everybody reads it. The the Anglo-Indians, a portrait of a community. I need to tell you about it. It's 600 pages, but don't get psyched out. You can read it like a buffet uh, in small, small parts. Uh, and I'm really grateful for LF for allowing me to, to go the whole hog and write about the community. So coming back to this, I'm saying that, you know, it's um, uh, it's it's been a gradual process. And I think our language and our schools have really helped us. I'm sure you and many others like you have been to our schools and that's an immediate connect, you know. That's a, no, it's not a religion. Everybody who maintains their Hindus remain Hindus, Muslims remain Muslims. But you can't help it if you speak like me and I speak like you. So that's the Anglo-Indian connection. Or you dress like me and dress like you. Or some of the things that we do also. Many, In fact, there was a chinta when, when we were getting one evening independence. You know, people wondered, Anglo-Indians wondered, whether, will we be able to dress like ourselves? Will we be able to speak like how we want to speak? Now, I think it's the reverse. Everybody, you know, if you look at 1940s, 50s, 60s, India, but now you don't see that. You know, now if you go to a nightclub, it's not Anglo Indians only. But if you went in the 50s, 60s, 80% were Anglo Indians. Now it's everybody. So I think lines have blurred. It's important for everybody to maintain their cultures. This is important. So me as an Anglo Indian, you, know, you as a Bengali, or somebody as a Punjabi, we can't we can't become a melting pot. We share. I'll enjoy everything of yours. You enjoy everything of mine. But I think the Anglo Indians have really fitted into India because it's so open-minded, so welcoming, it's so secular. The moment you, that changes, if God forbid, if that changes ever, then Anglo-Indians and many others will be uncomfortable. My final question is perhaps hinting at that potential change. Do you feel that India as a society is becoming more polarized, that we are doubling down on identities? Or is it just because of the nature of media, social media in particular, that prejudices that were long festered are now being more openly expressed? Our mind is not to judge. I'm not an expert is to tell you why it's happening. You know, whether it's because of social media and it was there and it's festering now, etc. I can just tell you that India has to progress like it's progressing in terms of whatever else is happening. But in ethos, in who is an Indian and, and uh, you know, you are so few, therefore you'll be dominated. That's not India. That's not India. In fact, the smaller the minority, the more protected you should feel. You know, that's what I feel. Uh, our minority is extremely concerned. Yes. Uh, justifiably, rightly so. However, having said that, I always believe also and I stand for minorities also have responsibilities and duties. You know, so it's important for me as a so-called Anglo-Indian leader or spokesman or somebody who belongs to the Parsi community or the Muslim community or the Sikh community to come out, you know, and speak about our Indianness. We don't have to prove, uh, you know, how patriotic we are. I don't need to stand over there and say we want, we've got such a small community has got so many Mahavir chakras, Veer chakras and, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? Ashok chakras. I don't need to say that. But I need to be visible speaking Bangla or being in the Kolkata Book Fair, if you know what I mean. And that, uh, that there's no replacement for that. So India, that fabric of India should never be lost. It's all there in the constitution. You follow the constitution, can't go wrong. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I have a great time at KLF. Thank you very much.